Hello and welcome to Deep Macro's The Future of Finance podcast. Today I have Masa Wakatabe as my guest. He was the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Japan during Governor Kuroda's second term from 2018 to 2023. He just left the bank this April and is now a professor in the Faculty of Political Science and Economics at Waseda University in Tokyo. He was at the center of the bank as it finally began to pull Japan out of its long-term deflation. Or did it? That's one thing we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Masa. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. No problem. Um, you know, I was in Japan a few weeks ago, and I wanted to start by asking about inflation. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the public bath, the price is up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dry cleaning prices are up. Ice cream bars are up. And if anybody's been to Tokyo recently, they know that hotels are out of control. Right. <laughs> so the numbers show that inflation is about 3%. Uh -huh. If you look at a Western core basis. Right. There's a big debate about how much is domestic and right. how much is external. Right. Can you comment on how much you think is from the real domestic economy? Right. Um, I think that's a good question. I mean, that's uh, that's the uh, must. We, we have to explain sort of the, the causes behind the inflation. I would say, you know, this uh, inflation in Japan has been uh, caused by the external shocks, the supply shocks uh, uh, to begin. Uh, then, you know, we have a component of the kind of demand shock. Uh, because uh, the government and of course the DOJ have put uh, injected the money into the economy. And the, remember, the Japanese economy has reopened its economy after the pandemic uh, uh, later than the United States or the Euro area or the UK. So that uh, we are still in the middle of sort of the uh, reopening phase. And uh, the, uh, we have reopened our countries to uh, tourists. Mm -hmm. The tourists are coming. And so in that sense, we have a sort of growing component of aggregate factor. But I think still the majority of the um, the Japan Japan inflation has been caused by the, the uh, supply side shock. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, you talked about the um, for example, uh, the food. Okay. Uh the if you take a look at the uh, the latest CPI figure, the uh, food and food related uh, the items. Have a sort of considerable uh, weight, and uh, if you take a look at the sort of distribution of price changes, um, you don't really see the sort of nice sort of a bell shape uh, distribution. You have a two peak, three peaks uh, kind of distribution. So the, the other half, I think, the, the higher peak uh, have something to do with energy prices and also food prices. So uh, in that sense, you know that I still think that you know that's. Um, I cannot say you know the, how much how much mm -hmm. uh, exactly, but I think that's still the the surprise and shock components are there. Okay. What about what about the weekend? Because again, as a consumer on the streets and the shops of Tokyo, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's clear that some import prices are rising. Uh, but on the other hand, it sometimes seems that uh, even imported goods, the pass through has been sort of small, mm -hmm. uh, given how much the yen has depreciated. I see. I see. Do you think the weekend? Uh, is a big factor? Has the pass through been about what you would expect, given we're very close to a one fifty end of the dollar now? Right. I think that the uh, um, the there is a study by the DOJ staff, and uh, they have taken a look at the uh, sort of evolution of the pass through rate uh, from the exchange rates, and uh, they found out that the, the first of all, I think that the uh, the impact of the pass through uh, from the exchange rate on the CPI inflation rate has increased and has been increasing. And because of the, uh, the rise in uh, import goods uh, penetration in Japan. So around 2010, I think that there is a kind of the, the increased uh, increase in the, the import price, uh, import uh, goods penetration rate. So that's, uh, if you believe, you know, that's uh, combined with that and uh, the increase the past uh, through rate, then you should expect more, I think, that, uh, uh, impact for the exchange depreciation again on CPI. But I think that it uh, that study also shows that it takes a kind of a time. So it's not like the, uh, the immediate one. I think that it will uh, affect, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, throughout the, uh, the course of the, uh, the, the time. So I think that it may show up. Uh, but I think the um, right now, the, the volatility, the level is uh, kind of stable. At around 148 to uh, you know seven uh, per data, so that if you don't have a sort of a, a big sort of a movement 
uh, you don't really have an impact on uh, the, the CPI inflation rate. I see. Yeah, I um, at lunchtime I uh, was at a restaurant and they had glasses of wine for three hundred yen, <laughs> right. which is two dollars. <laughs> and I thought I'm gonna have to try this just to see. Give me three hundred. No, no, three hundred yen. Three hundred dollars for a glass. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I decided uh, if anybody can find a glass of wine for two dollars, please let me know. <laughs> um, maybe you're saying that the pass through is still to come from right. here, but uh, I was pretty shocked by that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but at any rate. Um, Again, following up on that theme, according to Deep Macro's work, uh, Japan's inflation is really quite closely tied to global inflation. Right. When global inflation goes up, Japan goes up. When it goes down, it goes down. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess if global inflation slows, mm -hmm. which um, it seems like it, it, it is, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that Japan's inflation can maintain its 2% target? I think it can. I mean, that's uh, on principle that you, you, you should say that it can. You know, that's, that's why your central banks are there. So. <laughs> and uh, well, but back in the 1970s, I mean, during the, the period of great inflation, um, actually we saw kind of divergent uh, price dynamics, inflation dynamics. The, the Bank of Japan uh, failed, I think, in the, the, the uh, first, uh, the, the uh, earlier phase of the, uh, the Great Inflation and succeeded in the later uh, uh, phase of the uh, Great Inflation. And, uh, you know, with Germany, uh, never experienced the Great Inflation at all. And so, you know, that's, uh, I, mean, it, uh, I must admit that the, the now, I think the economy has been globalized and interconnected. Uh, so closely that we see some sort of co movement uh, between these two kind of inflation rates. But still, uh, you know, uh, the, it's not really the, uh, the external factors only uh, which determine the domestic inflation rate. Uh, but having said that, the, uh, it becomes more difficult, mm -hmm. I think, for the DOJ to uh, achieve the 2% uh, inflation target in a sustainable and stable way. So it, it becomes a sort of a new challenge, I think, when the global inflation uh, slows down. Right. And I, I should have mentioned that uh, Masa is actually an expert in economic history. He's written <laughs> extensively uh, about many aspects of uh, economic history. So <laughs> it's <selectively. laughs> yeah, so talking about what happened in the 1970s. I think yeah. we should really um, listen. I think that's actually a really uh, interesting perspective. But um, uh, one thing about the bank that I, I get this question from investors a lot, so I, I just wanted to ask it, um, that the bank has a main view on the economy and on inflation, and it talks about risks. Mm -hmm. um, but especially recently, most of the discussion about risks mm -hmm. has been on the downside, that mm -hmm. it's above the 2% target, but gosh, it's probably going to fall below. Mm -hmm. Risks are all on the downside for next year. Right. And I have a, honestly, a lot of people are saying, but it keeps going up. Do you think that the bank is too focused on the downside? Or that do you think that it's not a fair criticism that it, or observation that in fact uh, the uh, uh, the risks are balanced? I think I think that the uh, nowadays I think the, the uh, actual government weather uh, also talks about absolutely mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, for the year two thousand twenty three. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, down the road, I think that to the next year and the year after the next year, uh, the BOJ is forecasting. Uh, the sort of downward trend, uh, uh, but I think that the, the the for the shorter term, I think that the the the, the BOJ people are now talking more about upside risks. Mm -hmm. But having said that, of course, that the uh, on balance, I think that the main projection is that the inflation rate goes down to let's say one point five percent or something like that. Uh, it has been uh, revised of course, but it's still uh, there are lots of uh, downside risks. Why do, you do uh, the BOJ people uh, emphasize downside risks? Uh, I think that there is uh, one major reason because the uh, Japan has been in a sort of deflation period for a long time, so that the Japan have not yet got to you has not got to used to the inflation of the environment, and so that the uh, still um, there are you can make a case that the you know that the uh, sort of so called. The differentiated mindset is there, so that the once you know that this uh, that this inflation, actual inflation right now, mainly goes by uh, supply side, uh, external supply shocks, uh, rain, then you know that you're gonna have to worry about sort of uh, the underlying uh, inflation rate. Uh, so so in that sense, you know that there is always a kind of concern among the BOJ people uh, uh, 
above the you know, integration dynamics. Okay. I mean, the um, I, I do also remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago that um, in the U.S. we thought that inflation was going to be very, very low. And uh, before you knew it, it was 9%. Uh, the Fed kind of got mugged by reality. <laughs> and there was a period where yeah. there were kind of small but persistent upside surprises right. to not only the Fed's forecast, but uh -huh. I think it's fair to say market forecast too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so I guess in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, is it possible that Japan has a big inflationary shock? Uh -huh. Is that an upside risk that we should consider? Or is it just so unlikely that it's safe to almost ignore it? I think if, uh, if you say, is it possible, the answer must be yes, of course. Uh, I mean, that's uh, uh, the very of possibility. Is it likely or highly likely? I don't find out. Uh, because if you think about the sort of the uh, uh, inflation dynamics as you uh, mentioned uh, happened in the United States and Euro area, uh, there were, you know, the, the, the pandemic, for right. example, and the aftermath of the pandemic, and uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, so that these major events, uh, of course, uh, would be uh, the cause for the Japanese inflation to spike up. Mm -hmm. uh, so, related to that question, I think you have to think about the the likelihood of, for example, major uh, sort of uh, food or energy and, and or energy shock uh, would happen uh, in the near future. And also, you know, that's uh, got for with the uh, Chinese invasion of China, Taiwan, or the, the really high geopolitical risks, uh, uh, or any major conflicts in the neighboring area. So uh, I think that these are, are still possible, mm -hmm. and but I think they are not highly, not highly, highly mm -hmm. like, okay. Um, along those lines, uh, the bank is uh, is uh, focused on wages a lot, so right? Wage right, growth, right, and it right. almost seems to think that um, higher wage growth is a precondition for it to really exit its uh, its a qualitative, quantitative, and qualitative easing QQE policy. Mm -hmm. um, why does the bank focus so much on wage growth? Is there a general reason for that? I think there is a the the good case for. Uh, for, to, to be uh, concerned about wage growth in Japan because uh, after all that, uh, if you take a look at the, the inflation dynamics uh, in the UK, uh, the US, and your area, uh, the goods prices are actually you know, not increasing, uh, staying the same, or even decreasing. Okay? And that is also true for Japan. So you cannot really count for goods to uh, be a sort of driving factor of inflation. So what distinguishes between the sort of 2% target, I mean, that's the, uh, the US uh, had been uh, achieved, had achieved 2% before the pandemic, uh, and Euro area didn't, and Japan didn't. Uh, I think that the, the difference uh, gets rolled down to the service price. Mm -hmm. And the, the major component of service prices uh, is uh, wages. Nominal wage growth. So that the um, you, if you think about you know what's happening right now in the state, uh, the the wage is the driving factor of inflation. So in that sense, wage growth is the uh, sort of the uh, the cause, the driving factor of the underlying inflation. So to uh, reach two percent inflation target in Japan, uh, I think that's for sure for the other countries. Uh, you're going to have to see sort of the uh, increase in service prices uh, by 2%. Uh, and then to achieve that, I think you need to have more than rate. At least, I think that's 3% or something. Okay. And then, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, wage data sources <laughs> in Japan, the official data. Um, are they any good? Uh, do you think that uh, they are accurate? That that be the the kind of nagging question. I think that uh, many people are not talking about the importance uh, of uh, raising wages. Uh, but to begin with, I think we don't have in Japan we don't have a really good uh, sort of wage tracker. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you have a graduate period thing that yeah has a wage tracker, and that's good. Uh, and actually, so so what hap what happens is that uh, the monthly labor statistics. Uh, uh, issues uh, sort of monthly uh, the wage data, but that figure is uh, an average. Okay, 
So when the uh, the composition of the uh, people and also the composition of the uh, the, the hours work change uh, changes, and some people like to you know take more leisure uh, over work, then you have to think about sort of the uh, what is the real uh, wage, what is the, uh, the actual sort of uh, accurate wage, and the, the that that particular statistic. Issues only one uh, year statistic statistic statistical data to figure uh, things about the, the composition effects. Mm -hmm. So we do need a, a sort of the year wage growth trade tracker on real time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so that's why you know that uh, we have problem. Would you um, guess if you had to guess? Mm -hmm. Would you say that actual Wage growth is stronger than the monthly numbers say, or weaker. Uh, do you think that there's a bias, or is it just sort of randomly? <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I my guess is it's biased, and particularly because you know that if uh, the new uh, uh, comers are coming to the labor market, and if they uh, you know at the start with a sort of lower wage rate, uh, or you know that you have an increased number of strong wage. Uh, workers, then you know that the average concept that should go down. So that in that sense, uh, uh, kind of understates the actual wage growth. Uh, right now, what's happening is that the market wage rate, uh, you know, that's for the sort of hourly wage rate for, let's say, the working at um, a restaurant or a bar, that is actually increasing. Okay. So, uh, you know, the hotel, you know, you talked about, you know, higher price of hotel. Actually, the, by the way, the, the hotel has been, hotels in Japan have been sort of a constraining the price because they cannot get uh, a lot of people to uh, work with. Uh, but nevertheless, that, because of that, the, uh, they offer higher wages. Okay. Uh, but right now, I think the, the non-regular workers, uh, the number of employment of, uh, non-regular workers is actually decreasing or the staying the same. So uh, people now are being hired as the kind of regular workers. Now, that part is uh, tricky, but my guess is that uh, perhaps right now the wage status is kind of under-reporting the actual mm -hmm. wage rate. Right, okay, good. Um, what about if we think a little bit more broadly and it's maybe not something, um, it's not really in the bank's territory, but um, Income inequality is a topic that okay. is uh, uh, up in, in many countries. And uh, sometimes you hear about it in Japan, but mm -hmm. do you think it's rising? And is it something that the central bank should be paying attention to? Okay, there are two questions. Okay, but uh, the, for the first question, that's first of all, um, the uh, you have to think about which uh, statistics mm -hmm. uh, uh, to understand the income inequality uh, dynamics. Uh, one is one obvious candidate is of course Gini coefficient, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and the second one is of course uh, the, uh, the, the one by uh, uh, World Inequality Database WID, uh, compiled by uh, you know Piketty and his work. Um, if you look at these two figures, and also the the, the next issue you have to think about is that you should think about the uh, the pre tax income. Or initial income and the pre uh, post tax or post redistribution income. Now, uh, the Japanese statistics shows that the Gini coefficient for initial income has been increasing, okay. uh, but not for post redistribution uh, Gini coefficient. And the same thing can be said about the WID figure. The, the top 10% uh, share of the top percent uh, people. Uh, it has been increasing in Japan, but uh, the last time I checked, the WID showed that there is a kind of flat uh, movement uh, from 2010 to 2020. Maybe that's because of the data issue or something. But now we can we cannot really say that uh, uh, the, we have an increasing trend uh, in uh, income inequality. Uh, if you think about the post uh, redistribution uh, income. Uh, so that's one one issue, and also the, the if you compare Japan's uh, Gini coefficient uh, against other sort of OECD uh, countries, Japan sits in the middle. Okay. So uh, so that 
is not really uh, so that goes against the perception that Japan maybe be more eco society. So Japan has become more eco, but uh, it's still in the middle. So uh, it's not like the United States or UK. So the second question uh, that's the um, the I think the kind of textbook answer to that uh, is that the 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 central banks uh, are the uh, responsible for macroeconomic stabilization. So if you think about you know the three uh, major policy areas: growth policy, and macroeconomic stabilization, stabilization, and the redistribution, uh, the central banks uh, should be responsible for macroeconomic stabilization. So in that sense, that the income distribution itself should not be the concern of for central banks. Uh, however, uh, the central banks have a mandate about price stability okay, and of course financial system stability. These two things uh, can be sort of closely related to in the income inequality dynamics. And one particular area I have been following is the impact of the growing income inequality on the neutral or natural rate of interest. You know, that if you have a sort of a unequal society, then you know that perhaps that would mean you know, more saving than the demand for uh, funds. So that the natural or neutral rate of interest may go down. Okay. So that that is uh, that should be the a concern for central banks. Okay. Wow, that's yeah. that's uh, pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, pretty heavy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, Maybe uh, not that one but yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> but sort of factor is uh, of course the impact of the market policy on income distribution mm -hmm. or wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. And I think many people are arguing that it is a kind of hotly debated area. Uh, my take is that you know after, for example, the, the introduction of QE, okay, the the Purchase of assets mm -hmm. okay, uh, may have benefit sort of uh, wealthy people right. or those who own wealth uh, uh, the, uh, assets. Now, um, the my sense is that the uh, the monetary policy could affect in several channels, and one is that the, it is uh, closely related to the employment. So uh, the monetary easing would be to a lower unemployment. Uh, which means, you know, that those who uh, are affected by the uh, business cycles are usually the lower income people. So in that sense, you know, market policy may sort of uh, uh, raise the living standard of those uh, who are living in lower income uh, status. So, so this is a complicated stuff. Uh, so, but we have to, you know, uh, think about this uh, effect. Okay. Um, Shifting to kind of the monetary framework, yes. the overall framework, um, you know, the bank has what it calls a quantitative and qualitative easing framework, um, and it's uh, it's pretty complicated. Um, mm -hmm. There's a target for short-term rates, uh, for long-term bond yields, mm -hmm. uh, with a range and a cap. Uh, there's kind of a target for monetary quantity, at least there used to be. Um, asset purchases, forward guidance, uh, there's a lot of components to it. Um, can you state in really simple and short terms uh, what the bank's policy is and why it has so many pieces to it? I think that the uh, the the most simple answer is that uh, the BOJ is uh, uh, aiming to achieve the two percent inflation target by whatever policy necessary. Okay. So uh, so so that the rest is actually details, uh, but uh, details are complicated. I must. Be. Uh, the why it becomes uh, complicated because uh, after 2013, the 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 BOJ has been you know struggling to achieve that target, so that the uh, we had to uh, the BOJ had to uh, you know uh, sort of introduce one policy after another, okay. and uh, the uh, as the time goes by, the, the BOJ has to. Be worried about other things like you know, the so-called side effects and the impact on the financial system and so on and so on. So, so in that sense, it becomes complicated. So it's a history dependent thing. But I think that's the, the, the simple object, the, the objective is simple. Mm -hmm. And the, what BOJ is doing is whatever it's uh, available, and we will we, use it. Right. So 
probably, so it's fair to say that the bank prioritizes the um, impact rather than a clean theoretical uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, statement. I mean, I think, but in, do you feel that the general public understands that they can see the overall goal is simple and that the means will change depending upon the circumstances, but that doesn't really matter as long as the, I, I, I feel yeah. that the public. Well, I mean, that's uh, unfortunately not. I, mean, that, yeah. uh, I, I am a professor of economics and, uh, you know, right now I'm a professor of economics again. And uh, you can tell, you know, that's uh, the, my student reaction to my course. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Even economic measures do not really truly understand what the complexity, complexity of the market policy. Uh, and uh, I can give you one example. I think that uh, we do uh, uh, surveys mm -hmm. uh, on households about the uh, monetary policy and the price of And the, at most, I think 20% of the public those who are asked the question um, have ever heard uh, the, the word inflation target 2%. So is that high number or not? I mean, at 20, 23, you know, 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of people do not uh, really sort of understand that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they are not really interested in that stuff. Uh, for, you know, it's a, uh, an obvious reason that the, the, we have an expression for rational ignorance. And you, you are such a uh, ability to, um, uh, collect and assess information uh, is uh, um, limited so that you're going to have to uh, allocate this uh, um, attention uh, uh, very uh, scarce uh, resource to many other things. So I think that the monetary policy comes uh, not as uh, the top priority for the concern. Yeah, but it, they don't like it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's for sure. Yeah, but they don't like unemployment rate as well. Right. Yeah, as well. Yeah. So it's a uh, it, it's a challenge. Okay. Um, real interest rates in Japan now are deeply negative, and it took a long time, right. you know, for for that to happen. But um, um, with the uh, if the bank has a well, the, the short term interest rate is fixed, and so but even longer term bond yields uh, have been mm -hmm. at a certain cap and. Now they can fluctuate a little bit, but they're still capped at one percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, does that mean that the current policy gets more and more stimulative for the economy, for inflation, mm -hmm. even if the bank doesn't do anything because of these inflationary pressures driving down real interest rates? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but it depends also. Theoretically speaking, it depends on the the movement of the neutral, the mm -hmm. natural rate of interest. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the, so depending on the, it depends on the target level, uh, but equilibrium rate. Uh, but if it's given, uh, or you know, if it stays constant, uh, or it may uh, have risen a little bit, uh, then you know that we can say that the current policy becomes more stimulated. Uh, for sure, I think so. In that sense, I think the YCC is now really working uh, to become a truly sort of a um, Stimulant, right? Before that, we didn't really have the actual inflation and actual inflation expectation. Mm -hmm. Now we have actual inflation and actual inflation uh, expectation. So that you know, keeping the, the nominal interest rate uh, would translate into a stimulant point. So in that sense, you know, it becomes more stimulant. Okay, so I, I wanted to move to uh, yield curve control uh -huh. or YCC that. Um, um, since last December, the bank has adjusted it twice. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was in December, and you were there. I was there. Um, the stated objective was to improve market functioning. Mm -hmm. The second one was in July, uh, after you had left, and it seems like that one is a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, and that indeed, um, given that inflation is there, that there's some inflation expectations, do you think that the second one is more designed to allow market forces to kind of tamp down, uh, to, to adjust to supply and demand, and hopefully to uh, remove some of the stimulative effect of the I see, I see. Um, I think the, the still, uh, you, you know, uh, some commentators are saying that the, uh, the July decision is the end, or the, the beginning of the end of the mm -hmm. YCC. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think it's uh, still premature because you know that it's still not sure that the uh, the the end result of this kind of action. Okay. So you know that uh, we have talked about sort of the external factors. Uh, we don't know, you know, to what uh, the the world, the world economy uh, would impact the Japanese economy down the road. So, but uh, clearly, I think there is an element that the uh, the, the July decision uh, tweaks and changes the YCC uh, uh, wider than the you know, December decision. Now, uh, why is that? I think it's uh, that the main reason is not to abolish the YCC prematurely, but to uh, kind of sustain the YCC. Uh, because what the, the BOJ is worried uh, the, the, as the, the worst case scenario is that they've been, uh, they would be uh, cornered to uh, abandon the YCC altogether. So that the, the main object is, of course, as you said, that the uh, two sort of accommodate sort of supply and demand factors uh, into the market function. That's, uh, that's all one way to uh, describe it. But the, the other way to describe this uh, change in July is to um, the, uh, make uh, the YCC a uh, little bit sustainable. Mm -hmm by precisely uh, adjusting to the market first, so that you don't really face a situation when you know that the BOJ has, has to advance the mm -hmm. uh, quickly and immediately. Yeah. So in a sense, it's a kind of a, you know, taking steam out of the, uh, the market. Mm -hmm. And then by doing so, that the, the YCC would remain. And uh, you know, that's uh, in uh, the, the the long-term interest rate uh, in Japan has uh, um, have risen a little bit by I think the twenty five or thirty five or thirty point. Uh, but given the uh, the inflation dynamics now and the inflation dynamic uh, expectation generated now, uh, the uh, the the question is uh, the impact. Of that uh, the date uh, increase, it's um it rate increase nonetheless, but. Uh, I think the uh, the impact itself is quite minimal. Okay. Um, this might be a little bit of a difficult question, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when the Fed was exiting its policy, mm -hmm. which also had uh, many components to mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. uh, it made extensive comments on the sequencing. Right. What was it going to do first? Right. Mortgages, treasuries, rates, uh, forward guidance. Right. Right. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of focus on the sequence mm -hmm. from the Bank of Japan. Mm -hmm. and, it's tied up in the uh, issue of communication, right? Of course, I believe, and uh, um, clearly, uh, the new governor has said that they want to communicate clearly. Is it? I mean, how is this going to be communicated? Uh, will there be an exit plan that will be released, and that you know, um, conditional upon, say, inflation or wages or something, uh, the BOJ will do ABC. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think this is going to be communicated? Right, that's a tough question. I think that's the, uh, the, the one of the biggest challenges I had for the BOJ. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you know, the difference, you talked about the difference between the Fed and the BOJ. The, uh, what explains the difference uh, is just one word, history. <laughs> so mm -hmm. BOJ, the Fed has been, uh, you know, succeeded in uh, stabilizing inflation rate at their time. I mean, now, of course, they uh, uh, overshot the inflation rate uh, recently, and uh, now it has corrected its policy. Uh, but I think there is a kind of the, uh, the understanding among the markets and among the economists that the BF Fed can be trusted. Uh, for the BOJ, I think we haven't yet reached 2% inflation target. So that the uh, any change in policy could be interpreted as a kind of premature tightening, uh, which would jeopardize the, uh, the achievement of two percent inflation target. So in that sense, you know that the, the BOJ has to be extra cautious about talking, uh, even hinting at the, the, the possibility of the strategy. Um, so um, so uh, in an ideal situation. I think the BOJ would like to see that uh, the, the market and market participants and economists would understand 
the, the context and also the, the BOJ sort of uh, intentions uh, not to jeopardize the achievement of Russian target and uh, to not, not engage in premature tightening. Then you know you can actually talk about the more precise plan of the strategy. Uh, but right now, even though the actual headline integration and core and other figures show that the, uh, they are overshooting the target, uh, the the BOJ uh, is still not so confident about the, the perception of this inflation dynamics among market, market participants and the Congress and the media people. In fact. You shouldn't forget the media. So, so, so in, in that sort of situation, still delicate situation, uh, the communicating communication is uh, is a challenge. Yeah, you would have to uh, to say, keep saying that the uh, we are not going to change this target. No, no, first of all, and so any talk about so changing the target would be detrimental to achieve achievement of the target. Uh, up to the same. So, so that's just kind of that the situation we are in. Yeah, the okay. DOJ is in. Okay. Um, question on the yen, which uh, everybody knows is quite weak, uh, dollar yen 148. Uh, uh, Deep Macro has a valuation model. Um, we look at the real trade weighted yen against 30 different countries, <laughs> and um, um, it's weaker than at any time since 1980. It's actually more than 30% below the 1980 level. I mean, 1980 was 43 years ago. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it's weak. And I guess I want to ask, is there a point at which the authorities just say enough um, because a weekend will have some negative impacts? Uh, or is this still within boundaries that are acceptable? Well, um... The first of all, I think that the uh, the re remember that this goes back again uh, to the sort of fundamentals of the conduct of the policy. The and also uh, it's it's been backed up by historical experiences. The uh, whenever the, the central banks target the exchange rate, uh, I'm not talking about the developing countries, but for the advanced countries, it's. Uh, the, Full mobility of capital and flexible exchange rate, then the, that would be a uh, not good thing, I think, for central banks to target exchange rates. Uh, I'm not talking about the wall. I think that they could still intervene uh, for smoothing the uh, not to uh, sort of target the south level. Uh, but I think that the uh, to uh, the target at some sort of exchange rates. Uh, is not a good idea for central banks. And history shows because um, the last time which happened was uh, interesting enough that that was uh, 1985, mm -hmm. the Prada Accord period. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1985, the Prada Accord. Uh, I um, have been arguing that uh, in my book and uh, in many places that that was the starting point of the French bond yeah. because that, that was derailed macroeconomic policy uh, priorities. And um, so uh, so that that was bad. And uh, I don't really want to repeat that mistake. Um, the But I think theoretically speaking, what uh, the central bank can do is that, suppose you know that the uh, you feel confident about achieving 2% inflation target. And also, you are more worried about upside risk. Uh, coming from sort of a uh, exchange rate you know, for the movement. And given you know, that that exchange rate movement uh, comes from the sort of the policy, market policy decision, then you know that there is a theoretical case uh, for taking care of, uh, uh, of uh, exchange rate movement to achieve price stability. Uh, but right now, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, the, Still, I believe you know that this, uh, you know, that the uh, weakening yen um, has been, you know, the, driven by the first of all uh, strengthening data, and of course against other currencies dependent weakening. Uh, but uh, you know that uh, that episode may uh, well be over once you know that the other central banks uh, stopped hiking, stopped hiking. 
So, so in that sense, you know, that's the, I'm not, uh, I don't think that this uh, will go on forever. It's okay. Depreciation. Okay. So I, maybe finally, um, I may be getting my history a little bit wrong here, uh, but um, the government and the Bank of Japan have sort of an agreement that they really want to get rid of inflation. And um, there's been talk about why doesn't, I guess my question is, why doesn't the government declare that the era of deflation is over. Right. It seems like this would be a big plus for the government, for sure. Mr. Kishida. Sure. Uh, it could have a positive effect on sentiment. Right. Um, I think investors would appreciate it. Right. And after all, um, inflation is 3%. Uh, it's been above the target for a while. And the for setting aside what the CPI says right now, mm -hmm. it does seem that the overall behavior of uh, companies, of individuals, mm -hmm. is less, there is, it isn't deflationary like it was 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just get the declaration <laughs> that deflation is over? Right. Um, I think if uh, this uh, situation goes on, the, the government is close to the declare that. Um, the, by the way, you know, that's uh, the declaration is uh, the sole responsibility of the government. Correct. Yeah, uh, because uh, the, uh, the BOJ uh, does not say such a thing. Uh, although we say we are not making inflation, <laughs> we keep saying that. Uh, but we, that is a kind of description. Uh, I think that back in 2013, the, the government had uh, laid out four criteria. Uh, for ending, for to announce the end of inflation, and one is uh, CPI, uh, the other is a GDP deflator, and the third one is a uh, unit price cost, and the third, fourth one is the output gap. Okay, so if you take a look at that, I think that the um, you know that the uh, output gap is now um, slightly above zero, so it's positive, but it's not. The year, I'm not quite sure that that is consistent with the target level. Uh, unit uh, labor cost, I think it, you know, it's uh, increasing, but again, it's not really, uh, I'm not sure that this is constant, consistent with 2%. Mm -hmm. So I think you can say that they, they have uh, sort of achieved two out of four, but not really the all of them. Uh, I'm, I, I, I I, I have honestly no idea that, that the government is still sticking to those <laughs> four criteria. Uh, uh, but I think that if you take a look at four criteria, still, I think it takes a little bit more time to achieve the uh, third one or fourth. Okay. I, I told you all that he was very good at the history. So <laughs> hopefully that <laughs> recent <doesn't>, history. Yes. <laughs> um, well, anyway, uh, Masa, thank you very much. Uh, really informative. Yeah, and um, we hope that it continues to you know, go well uh, for Japan, the Bank of Japan, and yourself. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. The content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this material constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Deep Macro Incorporated or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in, in any other jurisdiction in which such solicitation or offer would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. All content is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. None of the information constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any of the information constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. There are risks associated with investing loss of principle as possible. Some high-risk investments may use leverage, which will accentuate gains and losses as securities or firms' past investment performance. Is not a guarantee or predictor of future investment performance.